What's up, everybody? Joe Brown here. This is the Heresy Financial Show, and I've got a fantastic guest on the show for you today, Mark Moss. Many of you follow him already, and we are talking today about the cycles of history, how there are multiple cycles right now converging at this time that give us major hints and clues as to what to expect going forward into the future. And we are also going to be talking about a new bill that uh, highlights a potential struggle between the Federal Reserve and the Treasury for control over the money. Mark, thank you so much for joining us today. I'm really excited to talk to you. Yeah, Joe, it's always a pleasure. I love uh, I love hanging out and talking to you. And uh, let's, yeah, let's get into it. All right. Hey, well, uh, we were talking about this a little bit uh, before. Um, there are a couple of things going on uh, massive things in the world right now. Um, from a really long-term perspective, if we kind of back out of this, look at what's going on with a, you know an eagle-eyed view of history. There are uh, uh, you know history doesn't repeat, but it rhymes, and there are cycles that we can look at. And this is a thesis you've been developing for a while now that there's not just one cycle going on, but multiple. Give us a, a broad overview of what you see historically right now. Yeah, yeah, there is so much going on. I keep thinking about this quote. I, I, I say it all the time, but Vladimir Lenin said, there's decades where nothing seems to happen, and there's days where decades seem to happen. And that's kind of where we're at right now. I remember I've been doing videos on my YouTube channel since 2018, and uh, mostly around Bitcoin. And uh, I remember 2019, 2018 and 2019, like, man, I started running out of things to talk about. There was just like nothing going on. And now today it's like, I need to make a couple videos a day, right? So it's like, that's, that's kind of where we're at in this cycle. But um, yeah, from a super high level, about a year and a half ago, I kind of put this thesis together of these three revolutionary cycles that are converging right now. And the reason why that's important to look at three of them is because just like any financial indicator, one isn't conclusive. And so you're trying to look for multiple indicators that are all telling you kind of the same thing. And so um, what I see, I recently read uh, Ray Dalio's new book, uh, The New World Order or uh, Changing World Order, whatever it is, a great book amazing book so much research I mean thick with charts I mean super super good I've been reading a lot about uh, Zoltan Pozar's latest work. I'm sure you've been reading it as well. He's been talking about this kind of uh, uh, Bretton Woods three kind of thesis that he has, which has been great. Um, and and those are great. And Ray Dalio has nailed it with this long term debt cycle. It's an 80 year um, long term debt cycle. I call it a financial revolution cycle. Great. Um, but then there's other ones that we need to look at as well. And so some of the other ones we look at is that on a 250 year time frame, we have a political revolution cycle. So about every 250 years, it's like a pendulum swinging back and forth, we we kind of max out at peak centralization or peak globalization, and then the world swings back towards decentralization. 250 years ago, the American French Revolution, pushing back on the centralization of the kingdom, the monarchy, setting up a decentralized government, the Republic in the United States. 250 years before that, Protestant Reformation. And so on a 250-year time frame, we have this political revolution cycle, which is happening right now. Um, of course, the 80-year uh, financial revolution cycle, like I said, Ray Dalio talks about the long-term debt cycle, 80 years. But then there's one more, and this is the one where Ray Dalio just, I, I, all credit to Ray Dalio, his book's amazing, he's he's forgotten more than I'll ever know, his, his research team is amazing, uh, Zoltan posed our same deal, but both of them have completely missed the technology piece. They haven't. They, they they don't even mention it, and and we have an eighty year long term debt cycle, financial cycle, a two hundred fifty year political cycle, but we have a fifty year technological revolution cycle, um, and it's happening right now. So about every fifty years, we have a technological revolution, not a technology. An iPhone is like a new technology. It's like a a phone and a computer. We'll put them together. That was an improvement. A technological revolution is two things. One, it changes the course of humanity. And two, it drives all financial markets. The last one, 1971, was the age of the microprocessor, which brought us telecommunications, internet, Zoom, or whatever what we're doing right now. The one before that, 1908, oil, automobiles, mass production. Before that, steel, electricity. And so the, each of those changed the course of humanity. Of course, with cars, everyone walked or rode horses for all of humanity. And then we had, we had transportation. But also, if we look at financial markets, what's driven the financial markets the last 30 or 40 years? Telecom, internet. What drove them before that? GE, GM. What drove them before that? Standard Oil, Carnegie Steel, right? And so that's what a technological revolution does. So they, they've completely missed that. And, and I looked at all three of those. So 250-year political, 50-year technological, 80-year financial, and they're all converging right now in the next couple of years. 
So they're all converging right now. And if you look at the outcomes of each one of these, these are uh, one of them is kind of like a pendulum. Another one is kind of like a like a revolution cycle. Um, are these cycles that are uh, uh, kind of uh, at odds with each other? And we're looking at kind of which one might uh, might win. Or are these kind of all pushing in the same direction? And it's just a, a big unknown on the other side. What, what do we see here kind of going into the other side? Well, it's definitely not fighting against each other. They all lead into the next um and it's not an unknown what's on the other side i believe history tells us what's on the other side so a lot of people think that what we've been going through for the last two years is a black swan event who could have ever predicted that we'd have a, a virus that would rip through things and these protests would happen who could have ever predicted mm -hmm. well <laughs> history did a lot of people did <laughs> uh, history did right and it wasn't so yeah. much the virus it was the response to it Right. right. Central right. government. Right. People protesting back. Um, and so what happens is politically we get to a point where there's too much government, too much centralization. And then people push back on that. They resist it. Now, previous. So let's say December 2019, there was over 10 countries with over one million people each in the streets protesting. 2019. So this is this is before this is not a black swan event. But what happens is politically, socially, we get to a point where we need change and then we're supposed to have solutions coming to problems. So then the technology is invented as a solution to the problem. So the, so the, the technological revolution that we're seeing today is decentralized technology. It's Bitcoin. It's a technological revolution. And it was created as a result of the, or in a response to the 2008 financial collapse. So it's a solution that came to a problem. And then that, te that technological revolution leads to the next financial cycle. So each one leads into the next, if that makes sense. Yeah. So they're not uh, not uh, unrelated at all. They're very uh, very tightly correlated with each other and influencing each other. Uh, just as uh, just as we saw, you know, there are things that are going on right now that wouldn't have been possible 50, 100 years yeah. ago because the technology enabled it to happen. We're going to start to see that's exactly right. Same things like that yeah. happening now. And, yeah, go and ahead. what's and 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 and, and on the technolo technological side, technological revolution side, if you look back through thousands of years of history, it's always technology that changes things. Mm -hmm. It's always technology, so it changes the way that we work, we organize, we communicate, but it also changes the balance of power. Mm -hmm. So, for example, a um, thousand years ago, twelve hundred years ago, the stirrup, the horse stirrup, was invented. That was a new technology, and that that allowed a knight to get on top of a horse with full armor, mm -hmm. and that knight could now stand up in his stirrup and he could take out a hundred peasants. Mm -hmm. But then, in the fifteen hundreds, we had the gunpowder revolution, and now a peasant with a gun could take out a hundred nights. Hmm. And so it's this technology that starts to change the way that we interact, the way that we work, which then changes the way that we organize, which changes the way that we have governments, which changes the way that we have warfare. And, and then of course, like I said, financial cycles as well. And that, that really does feed into the centralization and decentralization pendulum there. Um, similar to the American Revolutionary War, it was, uh, uh, that was the, you know, kind of peak centralization and it was the United States. It was a bottom-up government. It was complete decentralization. The federal government was basically not even a government by today's standards at that point. Yeah, that's exactly right. Um, and it, it changes the way that we organize. So if we go back 250 years ago, it was also the start of the Industrial Revolution. So pre-Industrial Revolution, it was just people lived on farms and we had the cottage mm. industry and that started pushing people into cities and factories and then it was like if you wanted to be successful you had to come to the united states and not just anywhere in the united states but you had to be in new york or chicago or san francisco you had to be in a city and what that allowed to do is that allowed this centralization to grow bigger and bigger and bigger and it's very easy for a government to squeeze whatever businesses or buildings they have mm -hmm. in that area because what are you going to do move your factory mm -hmm. um, you can't and so it made the what uh, uh, what's called the return on violence was very high, mm -hmm. right? They mm -hmm. could just, with a little bit of violence, a little bit of uh, force or extortion, if they were the mob, uh, they have massive returns. It was very easy. But what technology is doing now is we've seen just through the pandemic the last two years, now people are starting to move to Idaho and Montana and Colorado yeah. because they can work from Zoom. They're starting to decentralize. They're leaving the cities, but they're not just leaving the cities. They're also leaving the countries. And so now people are moving to Mexico, mm -hmm. they're moving to Central America, they're moving to Bali, places they could never live before. Right. And as people continue to move out, we're also seeing the size of companies get smaller. Mm -hmm. So now instead of having to build a big factory, I can just work online like I do. And I have people working all over the world for me. 
And as I, as my company gets smaller and starts to decentralize across the world, I maybe move out to different countries, it starts to make the return on violence very low. So now it's very difficult for the state, for the government to extract that value from the people um, that was very easy in the past. Man, these are such dense topics. I mean, we, I wish we could spend an hour on each one. One that I really want to uh, hear your thoughts on is something that you uh, recently made a video about in this transition time where we're experiencing kind of the whole financial system is is going through a change right now. And uh, on the other side of that, at least for a short period of time, we're likely to see a lot more uh, uh, decentralization, a lot more fracturing rather than it all controlled and all under one uh, under one roof. And uh, some places right now are moving to Bitcoin. Some countries right now have been stockpiling gold. Some countries won't do either, and they'll try and use force to get a central bank digital currency. But you've been talking about a recent bill that was uh, uh, introduced where... Uh, the Treasury might be put at odds with the Fed in developing its own uh, digital dollar, which is not technically a central bank digital currency. Tell us about what is going on there. Yeah. So, of course, right at a, at a time of turbulence, there's massive volatility. And so everybody's fighting for this power. And so what, what we've seen all over the news is this central bank digital currency, a CBDC. Of course, China rolled theirs out already. We hear about the the you know, the Federal Reserve trying to roll theirs out, even the IMF potentially rolling out a SDR, CBDC. Um, and, but we have all this volatility. If we had a, more time to d dig into this, um, there's a lot of geopolitics that are going on right now. And so, um, you know, from a Bitcoin perspective, and even if you're not listening to this and you're not into Bitcoin, you would say, well, um, there's no way the central banks will ever give up the control of money. There's no way they'll ever allow cryptocurrencies or Bitcoin to succeed. They'll never give that up. And I would say you're right. They won't. Um, F.A. Hayek famously said in 1980 that there will never be a sound money again until it's taken from the hands of the government, but not by force, but a sly roundabout way. Um, but I would agree that they, the central banks wouldn't give that up. But if that's the case, and I agree that it is, then why would the New York F Jamie Dimon Fed cede power and control to the ECB? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, the answer is they won't. Yeah. And they also don't want to cede power and control to the government either. And so to your point, there's this power struggle going on. And just recently, there was a bill submitted that allows the U.S. Treasury, which is the government, to create its own money, an, a digital dollar, an e-cash. Um, and this has historical significance. So in the article, they actually called it like a greenback. And the significance of that is that in the Civil War, Abraham Lincoln needed more money. And one of his advisors said, hey, uh, you don't need to go to the Federal Reserve and borrow money. I'm sure most of your listeners know you do a good job educating them, but most of your listeners know the Federal Reserve doesn't have the money. They create it from thin air. They give the reserves to the government, and the government has to borrow it from the Fed. Um, and so Abraham Lincoln's advisor said, why do we need to go borrow money from them when they don't even have it? Um, why don't we just create our own? They did. They used green ink, so they called them greenbacks. A lot of people in the United States think that's just like slang for a dollar. Of course, um, Abraham Lincoln got assassinated. Other than just me speculating, maybe it had something to do with him going against the Federal Reserve. Maybe, maybe not. But what's interesting is they're now referencing this greenback and saying the government, the Treasury, should just create its own money again instead of borrowing from the Federal Reserve. Um, and that's where we're at. So now we have all these, uh, let's say, call them factions inside the government and even multinational governments all starting to compete for the control over the money. Yeah, absolutely. So at the time, you know, when uh, when uh, Abraham Lincoln was looking at this, he was basically saying, hey, look, we can go to the, uh, the national banks and we can get the money uh, or we can just print it. And it it was looking, you know, because the, obviously the, the Federal Reserve was started in 1913. And so uh, presidents that came after that were able to tap that. And they were saying, hey, we can get free money. So Abraham Lincoln was a little bit of a pioneer here. Uh, since he didn't have a central bank to rely on, he said, let's just do it. You know, let's have the Treasury do it. And now uh, there's that that option is coming up again. Um my question, my, my question for you would be, do you, do you anticipate this would be something that they're laying the groundwork for so that when the Federal Reserve notes, the, the U.S. dollar fails, they can say, hey, well, it failed uh, because of all these problems and our new digital dollar at the Treasury will not have those problems, so it'll work better? Or do we, are you anticipating a power struggle here where uh, they're going to try and, uh, you know, somebody's going to try and win here? Uh 
uh, first off, you're right. Uh, the, the Federal Reserve was not around at the time of the Civil War. <laughs> so, But there was a national bank. And so right, they yeah. were trying to get this, the central bank installed in the U.S. There was several right. iterations of that before the, the formal IRS or uh, Federal Reserve Bank. Mm-hmm. Uh, but back to your uh, question, I believe it's a, it's a, it's a power struggle. Mm. And so what we're, what we're seeing is that we have two different factions in the United States. This gets a little bit into the geo, geopolitics of it all. But we have the kind of Obama, Biden, White House admin going along with the Davos European ECB crowd. Janet Yellen at the Treasury is part of that. And what I mean by that is we see that this Davos Euro ECB crowd is very pro-green, right, pro-equity, this and that. Uh, We saw that um, after the Glasgow, the COP26 meeting last year, they wanted to, they come out with this bill that was approximately $150 trillion to combat climate change. 135 to 175 ish, call it 150, 150 trillion. That's six over 30 years. That's six trillion a year for 30 years. But what happened is, um, June of 2021, Jerome Powell from the Fed met with um, Christine Lagarde from the ECB, and he said, Hey, hang, hang on. Um, the Fed's mandate is not climate change. The Fed has very clear mandates, and that's, of course, stable prices and, and uh, low inf- stable prices and full employment. He said, we're not doing that. Like, we're not printing money to go save the climate. And uh, my speculation, uh, maybe, but the very next day, the Fed changed the reverse repo rate by, ha- by five basis points, and it's been draining liquidity out of the European market since. So it kind of shows that the Fed is not going along with this ECB, Obama, Biden, kind of Euro Davos crowd of climate change, of course, and Yellen is all in on that. Yellen has, from the Treasury, has been saying this many times. And so I think it's a power struggle where the Fed is not going along with what the uh, current U.S. administration wants. And so the U.S. administration with Janet Yellen at the helm is like, all right, then we'll just make our own currency and we'll do what we want forget the fed hmm. and uh for for anybody who doesn't know what you're 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 saying that there's a power struggle there because the fed is not a government agency like the treasury is a department of the government the fed has has a different structure they're private quasi-private that's right quasi-private um and it's very interesting. So they, they don't have to go along with what the administration wants. As a matter of fact, the Fed was put together in such a way that the administration, whatever presidential administration is in power, can't really change the Fed, right? So the, the president can elect some board governors, but there's 12. I believe they can only do, uh, is it one per term? Uh, don't quote me directly on that. One or two per term. And so let's say that they the, the president wanted to change the power structure of the Fed, which is made up of the bank governors, right, 12 of them, um, he wouldn't be able to change enough to ever get the vote. And, of course, the Fed could just destroy the economy and get whatever president out that they wanted, right? Um, And so it is this quasi-semi, it's definitely more private than public, for sure. Uh, But it sounds like, and, and again, so this goes back to the bigger geopolitical thing. If the Fed, the New York Jamie Dimon Fed doesn't want to cede power and control to the ECB, then they're going to have to save the dollar. They need the dollar to remain strong. And it looks like they've gone and said, wait a minute, these green policies, $150 trillion over the next 30 years, is going to destroy the currency, destroy the dollar. We'll lose control. So no, we're not going to do that. We're going to save the dollar. We're going to keep our position. And I think that's this power struggle back to the point of the Treasury saying, fine, then we'll just print our own money. Well, it's uh, it's really interesting because, like you said, not only are we seeing this conflict and this uh, uh, struggle and uh, this uh, these cycles converge on like a global scale, but even at the at the level between the Fed and the Treasury, we're starting to see little things like this happen. Which, uh, but 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 why we're seeing all these little things happen is because of the three cycles that yeah. are converging right now. Yeah, yeah, and um, uh, looking looking through the the lens of those cycles, looking and seeing, hey we're going to get new systems out of this. Things are going to be rebuilt kind of on the other side of this. Um, You don't even necessarily need an alternative that is exponentially better than the system that we have right now because the system that we have right now is collapsing. And so anything that just works (laughs) will last. And uh, so, you know, we've, we, we could, you know, like I said, probably go hours and hours into these topics. 
Um, but uh, yeah, it's it fascinating uh, hypo- uh, uh, thesis that you've been putting together on these cycles. And um, we're going to be talking more about this in just a couple of weeks in person in Dallas at Market Disruptors Live. That's right. I'm super excited to hang out and, and share the rest of it with you because there's just so much fascinating stuff. And I love being able to bounce stuff off like uh, off, uh, off of you like that. So um, yeah, Market Disruptors Live coming up in Dallas. Can't wait to hang out with you for a couple of days. Um, I'll be talking more about this thesis in greater detail, sharing the charts and graphs, uh, the receipts as I, as I call them. Um, so showing you, showing you the receipts on that. And kind of, uh, like I said, it's not, for me anyway, I think history tells us where this goes. So it's not like we don't know what's going to happen. No, I think we do pretty clearly know what's going to happen. Um, and so I'm going to share what the, what, what I think that is. And of course, how we should be preparing for that. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Well, I highly recommend everybody who has the ability. I've got the link in the description below for everybody to sign up and, uh, love to see you guys there, have a drink with you guys and, uh, learn about what's happening now, what's coming in the future, how to prepare, save both, uh, preserve wealth and create more wealth through the transition. Um, exciting times. Yeah. Thanks so much, Joe. Always a pleasure. Thanks for being on.